partner, we... Oh, oh that's the oh. recording in progress. There you go. So, uh, green screen. Huh? So, I got a green screen because myself and my partner talk once a month. We call it the Super Fortress Hardcore Genki, which is hardcore, energetic, exciting things we've done and watched and listened to. And we talk about that for an hour um, on our friend's Twitch stream. Oh. And... Uh, for the first hour, it's us just nerding about what we've done, made, watched, Netflixed, etc. And then the following hour, we invite people on to talk about what they've been doing. So it kind of shows our audience other people's stuff. Mm. And maybe the, the folks that we invite on, if they haven't seen it, they might subscribe to what we do and watch us off. So, yeah. Well, this isn't Twitch. This is a podcast, <laughs> which is what old people do instead <laughs> of Twitch. Um, is that a pint of cider there, David? <laughs> No, it's it's tap water and lime cordial. So is it a very, very That's large very glass, or am I just being deceived by the wide it's angle actually, lens? It's only a pint, but it just looks very big. It looks very big. I, I suppose I can make this bottle look very big as well, mm. if I were to try. Oh, look at the size of the bottle I'm drinking. Mm. <laughs> that doesn't work. Okay, everybody. Um, the format is... Uh, fairly straightforward. We're going to have a little bit of a chat. Don't know how long that will go on with. I'll chat with one of you, then I'll chat with the other. You've got your hand up, David. Um, I think um, I want to record for you, but it says I have to ask your permission. Ah, uh, right. I have made you a co-host and that gives you recording permission. Right. So I'm going to record this computer. OK, that's, I'm recording now. That's great. You should then get a, a soundtrack which wouldn't be affected by that warping sound you get when one person's microphone cuts over the other. Uh, Laura, were you thinking of recording your own soundtrack? I noticed you've got the headphone and the microphone. I do. That's only so that I don't disturb other people. <laughs> OK, <laughs> that's fine. Um, So, yeah, no plans for myself. I'm recording it all on three separate soundtracks. It's just that uh, remote recording is sometimes clearer. Right. So. Uh, we chat a bit and then we share one person's image. Now, I've got Laura's ready to share. Uh, David, you're going to have to share your own image. That's right, isn't it? You didn't send me one, did you? Did bloody send it to you, Kev. Oh, and I said I'd got it, didn't I? Yeah. I, I RSVP'd <laughs> to say I'd received it. Jesus and then, Christ. do you know, the chances are I didn't bloody download it. Hang on. Have I put something as a uh, leech panel? I haven't put something as leech, leech. panel. Uh, leech Lovely. panel it'll be because i'm showing a panel um forgive me i'm being pedantic uh, right I, i'm being pedantic about the terminology i use for, for you uh, being pedantic that seems unlikely renaming things on my did you get your precious photographs uh yes hang on uh, that was on the the group i sent street. it to you i sent it to your um your full sock things. F email. You did. You sent it as email from David Leach. Images for tonight's talk. Now, I only want one. So, well, okay, well, well no. Basically, uh, what I've done, right? What I've done is a teaser the first and a one, big reveal. Yeah. Yeah. So the first one is a tiny little panel, and I thought I'd show you the whole thing, and then I've put in the cover of the thing as well. Right. Cover we won't need to worry about because nobody okay. would ever see that. But um, let me just open up those two. You want to open up one and two then? But then you're going to guess who it is. Uh, no, I'm I'm going to know who it is anyway. But Oh, uh, are you? Yeah. Uh, well, well, obviously I am, because I've just looked at them. But <laughs> I'm sharing this. Now, there's David Teaser Panel 1, has just opened on my screen. And... Well, it hasn't opened on my screen yet. Oh, yes, it has now. And Big Reveal for Kev F um, has opened on my... Uh, other screen there. Um, it's opened in a oh, it's opened in a very funny way uh, because it's a PDF rather than the JPEG. Oh, did you want? Oh, I didn't realise. So it's oh, it's opened in Acrobat rather than opening in. Um, I've got to stop the recording for a resumed. Uh, so we'll we'll share our pictures, then we'll talk about them. I'm going to share Laura's first. Recording begins now. Uh, tonight's recording may involve strong language and adult themes. I've met these people. I think that's highly <laughs> likely to happen. Uh, caveat emptor and all that. My name's Kev. Oh, fuck, I'm so sorry. Oh, you're the first one to swear, though. Yeah, that's Thank true. You. Hello and welcome to Comic Cuts, the panel show. My name's Kev F. Sutherland. You might know me as a writer and artist for Beano, Marvel Comics, Oink, Red Dwarf, Doctor Who, Viz, uh, the Scottish Falsetto Sock Puppet Theatre and my graphic novel adaptations of Shakespeare. But chances are you probably don't. My guests today talking comics are Laura Watton and David Leach. Hello. Hello. 
<laughs> now, for your pleasure, I'm going to sing the theme tune. Are you really going to sing it? Are oh, you right? <laughs> it goes like this. Comic cuts. We're looking at a panel, and we comprise a panel. There's a few of us, so the panel sees a panel, then we talk about the comics from the panel we've discussed, and we call that comic cuts. Be honest. The Harrison School of Singing, then. Uh, yes. Very I nice. have. Oh, I have what? to. I. You're on a separate track. I shouldn't be thrown off by you saying something. I have two guests with me today who have brought with them a panel from a comic or something close. We're going to see if we can identify it and talk about it. Maybe we and you will learn something about comics we didn't already know. Or maybe we'll just show off a bit and have an enjoyable chat. Let's see. Joining me from... Oh, Laura, I have no idea where you're from. Uh, Laura Hi. Watton, where are you? Hello, I'm Laura Watson, uh, alternatively known as Pink Apple Jam. Um, I'm originally from the West Midlands, a uh, very tiny town called Hales Owen, uh, but now I live in Cambridge. Oh, um, Cambridge. Yeah. You're known as Pink Apple Jam. I so am. the brand isn't Pink, Pink Apple Jam, you are. <laughs> well, it kind of crosses over. There's that weird Venn diagram, isn't there? I think with artists and <laughs> names and who we lurk as online, I think. So, yeah. Really? Yes. I've, mine's never entirely consumed me. I dropped my surname early on, but just because it's an old wieldy surname. And Laura, you work in manga. I do. I do. So um, I have been influenced by manga since early 90s, mainly originally from video games, Super Nintendo games, um, Sega Mega Drive games, lots of video game magazines used to publish these amazing um, full colour uh, replicas of video game artwork and just as I was getting into that manga translation started to kick off um, I've always read comics I used to read DC Digest Sugar and Spike obviously the Beano since birth um, Beano Dandy Hand Me Down comics you name it we read them um, so yeah basically I've just been consumed by comics all my life pretty much um, and reading get it becoming a teenager um, and getting into different types of comics as well so manga was really really inspirational for me um, and then I, I, I was basically so inspired by them I started making my own comics inspired very much by them um, so I started off as Pink Apple Jam um, started photocopying comics pre-internet <laughs> um, and selling them with my dad because my dad also used to go to comics comic cons comic mart so i'd have a little area on his table and sell them as well oh how um, old were you yeah. you I probably can uh, one like, to my comic inventions i might have done uh, we mainly mainly went to all the west midlands ones big memorabilia comic conventions at the nec in birmingham and things mainly i think i started going when i was about 11 and then i started making my comics when i was about 14 it was definitely in the middle of secondary school um and then i finished university uh, i did illustration and animation at university actually but then when I came out I got back into doing comics because I know I just had a lot of autonomy in making my own comics making my own stories um, and just as the early internet was kicking off um, I met up with a lot of other um, anime and manga inspired uh, artists and most of them happen to live in Cambridge so that's why I'm here <laughs> so I basically moved to Cambridge half from the the west to the to the east of England um, just to, to be a little bit closer to people who drew similarly to how I did and was uh, watching reading playing all the media that I was as well. So you've got the perfect tip for wannabe new artists or oh, the perfect tip I've got a book <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, I know on your website you give mm. tips to uh, what you call mangaka, which mm. is a word that is not usually part of my vocabulary, but <laughs> it is now. But what you did as a teenager, that's something that a kid could do now, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I think there are so many things that um, kids, beginner artists, you know, anybody of any age, really, I feel that there's a lot of uh, young and amateur slash frightened artists don't realize that people have been doing comics since before computers began. I know that I certainly did. You need some paper and a pen, maybe a ruler if you're lucky. And that's pretty much it, right? Would you agree? Oh, well, I happen to do a lot of classes in schools teaching kids exactly, exactly that. Pencil and paper because they're so rudimentary uh, exactly. and they can't be affected by a flat battery. <laughs> or a lost USB cable or whatever. Absolutely. And it's it's just the rudimentary begin. It's, it's encouragement, isn't it? I try and 
you know, if there's someone with a question or a query on a forum or Twitter or whatever, you know, I'm trying to get in there and try and say it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be perfect. So I do think that perfectionism puts a lot of people off as well. So would you call your work manga or, or manga styled British comics? Ah, but because I'm a British person. Um, I always say manga inspired comics because I love comics. I read all sorts of comics. It's just that manga was the thing that started me drawing, even though I had been into, well, self-publishing, I could say, even though I've been into comics since day dot. But is it possible to do manga if you're not Japanese and in Japan? It's hard, isn't it? And there's a great line in another American manga style comic called Drama Con, which is all the drama at a comic convention. And there's a line in it saying, Well, I'm not Italian, should I not bake pizza? So we always use that analogy to say it doesn't really matter. I have a number of Japanese friends who are really happy that um, comics from my friend's culture have come over and inspired someone else in a completely different country. So, so there's, there's a balance between cultural appropriation and uh, doing it good. Well, I always worry about cultural appropriation, but I've never pretended to be Japanese. Um, none of my friends that do it have pretended to be anything other than, you know, and I always use my real name, Laura, a.k.a. Pink Apple Jam, you know, alternatively known as me. It's not like a Japanese name or anything like that. Pink Apple Jam. Where did Pink Apple Jam come from? <laughs> so um, it comes from me enjoying drawing cute stuff, but also slightly bitter stuff as well, because not all apples are sweet. So I've drawn anything from, you know, cute, pretty tea party fashion dresses to like zombies with massive machine guns and stuff. So there's there's no like genre uh, pigeonholing in whatever I draw. If it makes me laugh or I'm inspired by it, I'm going to try and draw it. Talking of things that aren't entirely sweet, but they make you laugh and you enjoy them. My other guest is David Leach uh, joining us from, am I right? Hi, Wickham. Yes. Hi, Wickham. Home of the Hellfire Club. And Ooh. Israeli. The Hellfire Club. Oh, tell us more about the Hellfire Club. I've forgotten. <laughs> well, uh, um, Disraeli, our, one of our um, dead prime ministers, had a house there. And uh, it's on top of a hill. And at the bottom of a hill is, is the Hellfire Cave, where um, before Disraeli's time, it, it was basically a sort of orgy club for um, the uh, aristocracy. And they'd meet up in the caves and have um, wild orgies. If you actually visit the caves and you can, you can get, you can take a, you can, you can buy a ticket and go in. It's really not the best place for an orgy. It's, it's cold and dank and it's, there's nothing comfortable about it. So I kind of thinking that perhaps uh, over time it's, 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 it's legend has outgrown the actual truth of it. Or but maybe still. it's, or maybe it's insulation has worn out. <laughs> yeah, maybe it has. Yeah. Is this a tradition that continues in High Wycombe? Is it the home uh, of the swingers? I, 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 don't, I hope not. I hope not. Although, annoyingly enough, uh, in front of our house, we have a massive pampas grass, and I've lost count of the number of people who said, Oh, pampas grass, that means you're a swinger. And it's like, No, it's just, it's impossible to get the bloody stuff out of the ground. Pampas grass? Yeah. I, I had thought it was aspidistras or some flower that you put in your window. No, no. Oh, you, you might be, maybe, maybe that old gag about uh, OMO, leaving a packet of OMO in the window, which meant old man out. Um, but apparently, oh, try and explain oh, that to the kids yeah absolutely but uh, apparently no it's a uh, pampas grass if you have a pampas grass in your garden it means you're a swinger i'm not a swinger i just have pampas grass in my garden now there are some people there sorry, are some, I was gonna oh, say, forgive me laura so sorry i was gonna say do you have a sign saying not a swinger <laughs> As opposed to no no I, I much prefer um, opening the door and 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 uh, meeting people face to face and then terrorizing them that's much Amazing. more fun the sign yeah. would take all the pleasure out of it it's the toss of a coin whether you're going to get uh, swingers or Jehovah's Witnesses. Just be equally rude to both. Oh, I'm never rude to Jehovah's Witnesses. I remember once inviting them in and talking to them about my theory. And at the end of them, I asked them uh, uh, what was going to happen to me when I die. And there was a pause and, and one of them said, you're going straight to hell. <laughs> it's very nice. it's very there are some people who are legends in the industry and whose influence casts a shadow uh, that's uh, almost immeasurable in its scale and there are some people who've been on come dine with me how was come dine with me david <laughs> it was an absolutely glorious experience one that uh, i i look back with uh, look back at with great fondness it was perhaps one of the only times that, that both halves of my brain worked in unison to um uh, to help me. So I had the manic crazy side, which was doing all the acting. And I had the creative side that was writing gags for me. And uh, there, there was- didn't, a, you, didn't somebody have to cook some food as well? Oh yeah, I had to cook. Oh yeah, I had to cook food. Yeah, that was the easy part. That was that. I mean, I, I, I knew, I, yeah, my menu, I, I spent I spent weeks developing my menu. 
um that that was that was uh, that was great fun but the the, the, but the bit i, I <laughs> there's there's two things that um i got stopped in the street recently remember uh, bear in mind that i was on in back in 2013 i got stopped two weeks ago in the street and someone stopped me and said were you on come dine with me and i went yeah i was and he went oh wow i watched that one and it was like oh crumbs I think so, the frustrating thing is that that doesn't happen on the strength of people's comics work, which it should do. Uh, David has been working for everybody from uh, it was Toxic, where I think we first crossed swords. Or might it even have been Gas and the Damage way back at the end of the 80s when you were doing Arthur Pilkington, Chartered Barbarian, uh, then The Driver. Well, The Driver was in Toxic. Uh, Pilkington was in, in Gas and also your, your illustrious organ, um, Ut. Of course where I, I reused most of my gas stuff for art. Um, was, was this your first stuff? No, no, no. My, my God, my first stuff was back in 1986. I, I, I started out, um, so a bit like Laura, I mean, I've been obsessed with comics my whole life. I mean, um, yeah, I don't remember a time in my life when I wasn't surrounded by, I only surrounded by comics. And I've, in my studio now, which is also my library, I've, I've got the three books that inspired me as a kid. I could, I could hang on, just close the door. I could, uh, I could find the three books that inspired me. I've got my, my uh, Tintin, King Otica Scepter. I've got the original 1969, which was given to me when I was six. Over on the other side of the room, I'm pointing now, people who can't see me. I've got my Beano annual from 1972. I would have been eight, eight, nine, I'd have been nine. Uh, and then I have um, my whole stack of Giles annuals and one of those inspired me. So I, I love comics my whole life. Well, there's a whole paragraph we're going to have to cut out because that ruins the <laughs> yeah, surprise. Yeah, yeah, I realise that. I realise that. OK, OK. So uh, li listener at home, if you just heard an edit there, that's because David was about to spoil the whole raison d'etre of this entire broadcast. Uh. I have two guests with me today who've brought with them a panel from a comic or something close. We're going to see if we can identify it and talk about it. I've read this. Oh, yeah. I've done that paragraph already. Um, so joining me from X and joining me from Y, I've done that. You've done that. I've asked everyone on the panel to bring a panel to the panel. You can see these images on my website, Kevf Comic Festival. No. You can see these images on my website, kevfcomicartist.com, uh, or on my Twitter, or you should see it on the holding image for the podcast episode itself, depending where you get your podcasts from. But you won't need to see these images because we're going to describe them. <laughs> and we are. And first, I would like to have a look at the image brought along by Laura Watton. Bear with me. Can we all see that? Yes. Yeah, we can all see that? Yes. Okie dokie. Um, so we are looking at an image and um, I think, David, you should be able to describe what we're seeing. Okay. Uh, um, what I'm seeing is that the, uh, I'm looking at a, um, a page with three panels and on the top main panel, there is a, I assume she's a princess. Um, she has her, her hand pressed against her forehead and she's crying. And she has this beautiful uh, uh, dress. There's two levels to the dress. One of them appears to be made up of a star field. Actually, and she's got a cloak. She's got an ermine uh, uh, lined uh, cloak. Then this star field dress and then a, a lacy dress underneath that. And um, she's saying, there are so many people at Versailles today. There are so many. And then we see her sobbing. And then she says, I've lost. The crown princess has been bested by a prostitute. I don't imagine that's actually how she sounds, but in my head, that's how she sounds. For the benefit of the panelologists at home and the study line composition technique and that sort of thing, we're looking <laughs> at something that is manga drawn. Oh, yes. It is a black and white single page and will have been drawn, I'd imagine, with pen or a combination of pen and brush. We're reading this from left to right, although it would be from right to left in the original Japanese. And the woman is, oh, yeah. uh, she has a hand on her brow and she's crying those tears that they cry in manga, um, which will learn more about in a while in picture number two she stomps her foot i assume although it appears that the stomping of, of her foot is making the sound effect sob um again that could be the work of the translator there and in the final picture she's got big reflections in her eyes making a cross shape she's got steam apparently pumping out of her ears she's got tears flowing down her face and someone appears to have stolen her nose uh, david could you have a guess at where this could be from uh, yes, I can. I, I believe this to be what they call a manga. So it would have it would have come from a, a country called Japan. 
Uh, mangas are very interesting because it was actually mangas are inspired by uh, by the fact that they got nuked twice by the Americans, which I always find quite amazing. And the reason that the, the manga characters, or so I've been told, have big eyes like this was because it was the Japanese way of trying to represent Western characters. They gave them great big round eyes like this. I'm assuming this character is is, is Antoinette. Am I am I right? You are correct. Well, you're you going to find out. Well, can I can I have my oh. guess as well? Yep, yep, um, yep. I'm just going to say Marie Antoinette. I mean, damn it. David, <laughs> David may have uh, have uh, blown it for me. Uh, Laura, Thank tell us know. what we're looking at. Well done. We are looking at a page from the very, very long run in 1972 manga called The Rose of Versailles. Um, and it's only just been released in its entirety. Five massive volumes long by wow. publisher Udon in America. So yeah, this is Marie Antoinette. She's absolutely fraught because she has had to acknowledge a prostitute and it's beneath her. It's beneath her as a, as a queen. Uh, her royal robe is falling off. The background is full of angsty patterns she's absolutely crying because she's basically just lost she's she's lost her what's the word uh ranking in social uh in social status uh, and she's absolutely furious because i've actually got another page from the book and it's taken it's taken that long for her to to uh, try and avoid this situation i mean the rose the rose of versailles has been described as it makes American daytime soap operas feel restrained, <laughs> which I think is a very fair assumption and reason to watch. So it's, it's historical Rosa drama, Versailles. slightly fictionalized. Slightly fictionalized because um, it, the Rose of Versailles mainly focuses on a character called Oscar Francois de Jarge. And Oscar is a noble woman, woman, but raised as a son by her father. And Oscar is the commander of Marie Antoinette's um reportage the the king louis court at versailles um so basically of a, oscar is privy to this gossip and this this angst and this drama so we we see it through a fictional character however it is using actual historical contexts who's um, rose of versailles by, by? uh it's a, a japanese female author called ryoko ikeda and it was published in 1972 and the panel that I took that photo of was flipped. So you do read it left to right. It was actually from a book called Manga Manga, The World of Japanese Comics. And this was published in 1988 by Frederick L. Schott. And prior to the internet being a thing, this was mm. pretty much the only way in the late 80s, early 90s that you could see the, the vast range of manga examples, which was, which was in this book, which even though it's old, it's still fascinating reading. Well, so I absolutely recommend this book. The pre-internet uh, pre realm immediately comes to mind when we're looking at a book from 1972, but the historical research you'd have to do to do Versailles, when you're clearly not in Versailles, you're in absolutely. Japan, mm -hmm. um, is the research accurate? Relatively. I'm no historian, but I tell you what, it makes for some good, juicy, gossipy reading. And you can just flick through this book and pick it up at any page. Um, it got a maybe 54 i might be incorrect 54 episode animated adaptation in the late 70s it caused a complete fad in japan uh -huh. where women actually left their home country to visit europe to see the the court in versailles um it it inspires obviously numerous cosplays but it sold what is it it sold over 15 million copies worldwide since that time it is an absolute staple and should be in your reading repertoire even if you just pick up the first book it goes all the way to the the end of poor Marie Antoinette's life but also from the viewpoint of Oscar the revolution kicks off that's basically where the Rose of Versailles ends but it's fascinating it's so dramatic fictional characters real life historical characters all intermingling really it, really good this is tremendous David had you come across Rose of Versailles before no, I have never come across it before. And Ryoko Ikeda, sorry, mm -hmm. was that was Ryoko Ikeda male or female? Uh, female, yeah, absolutely female. Uh, she was part of a group um, of female manga artists who they kind of took over um, girls' comics in Japan in the late sixties, early seventies, being drawn and written mainly by men. They were like, well, we we can draw ours as well, comics for ourselves as well, and it, they went 
yeah, it was a real cultural shift. And I think and, and did it remain shifted? It did remain shifted. The amount of comics that we all know that Japan consumes still to this day in digital and via print um, is still phenomenal. I can only dream of it ever happening in the UK. Well, why do you think the Japanese continue reading manga in such volumes and we in Britain and even America don't? Um, I think mainly two reasons, and I think they're quite unfortunate. I think number one, um, the the treatment historically of British publishers not crediting, not paying artists, not maybe experimenting enough uh, American artists and writers going overseas in the late 80s, early 90s, I think decimated a, as much support and opportunity from our shores. I also think that in the late 80s, early 90s, the amount of comics that weren't available to women um, I remember there being lots of things like she and German holograms, uh, very pretty flowery things such as Rose of Versailles, like Lady Lovely Lux. They were mainly spin-offs of toys and cartoons. Mm -hmm. um, but there were stories, I know that there were stories like Bunty and Jinty and everything, but it did feel like it was the, the same. I remember reading my cousin's comics and it was very much the same. I felt that, I do still feel that British comics kind of enjoyed its success, but as readers grew older japan worked to create new audiences as their readership grew they created new magazines for older readers they created anthology magazines for uh, people who play sport cooking manga businessman manga and comics for moms who are going through difficult things there are the comics that talk about um you know your autistic child and life you know learning about that and all the differences uh, and a lot of these have been published, but not a lot. But I just feel like th there was so much growth in Japan, plus with mm. the cheerleading and the support of tradition, for example, wanting to champion print books that you are proud of what your country is proud of. Whereas I think in England, we still actually have that Victorian sensibility of comics are sub what we want, whatever that is, even though comics help with reading, comics help with expression, comics help with escapism. And I just feel like Britain just kind of stopped and it went off the internet and self-publishing. And... Well, David, what would your experience be? Well, I, I was just going to say that, that what was interesting about, about the British comic industry, uh, you, you had you had the three main big uh, British publishers. You had Odoms, you had IPC, and you had um, uh, the other one. Oh, the Fleet, other Fleetway, Fleetway, Polystyle. <laughs> yeah, DC Thompson. Yeah, but the Polystyle. DC Thompson. Cool. But basically, big ones like IPC and Odoms and uh, DC Thompson, what they would do is that the, the way that they set up publishing for kids, they'd get them at an early age. So you, you start very little, you'd be at nursery school and you'd read things like um, um, a Playhouse or if it was uh, Polystyle, it would be Buttons. So you'd start very junior. Mm -hmm. The idea was is as you got older, you then progress over to humor comics. So mm -hmm. there'd be things like um, uh, Wizard and Chips, Buster, Core, all of these things there. And those are aimed at ma male and female. And then the idea was that, that girls would then gravitate over to things like Bunty and June and all the other ones. And uh, that was that was from DC Thompson, Bunty, and that's not. And then IP, IPC, which tends to be a little bit grittier than DC Thompson, they did an amazing uh, uh, girls comic called Misty, which is mm -hmm. you know, legendary. Uh, now, the interesting thing was is that, that girls didn't, that they didn't really collect comics in the same way that boys did. So boys would gravitate onto things like after they left the, the humor titles, they'd move over to could be anything, Eagle, Warlord, Battle, Action and all that. Then they move on to 2000 e Then the idea was that the, the kids would stop reading comics and then they'd move on to magazines. So in this country, comics were seen completely as a kid thing. Whereas in Japan, as Laura's pointed out, comics were, uh, or manga, were, were aimed at all stratas of society. Whereas in this country, comics weren't. They were just purely aimed at children. Yeah. You're supposed to outgrown them and then you moved over to proper magazines. We should have had comics in those magazines because that's what Japan does. That's yeah. for sure. And yeah. you, your comics can be like um, fashion illustrations or completely surrealist art, something that makes you think. There's something that's quite different. But we just we just stopped. And I just find that so regretful. 
Oh, yeah. Me is too. there not also an aspect of British culture that we're very snobbish about words uh, because we feel like we invented literature in some way and we've always championed it. It's a thing we've been very good at and it's a thing that we export from our Shakespeare and our Jane Austen on down and our Dickens, of course, that uh, the pictures and stuff, visually orientated entertainment, it wasn't so much our big thing, even though we obviously spearheaded it with things like the dandy and the beano and our kids comics of the early 20th century but then the the stop reading comics and just read books without pictures took over and mm. became a mantra for every parent although, although i would say that that what we do have which is extraordinary uh and even now that sadly it's dying out is that we have an amazing history of of um cartoon illustrations like punch magazine and all the rest uh, uh, you look at newspapers and, and all that and comic strips and things there's been this incredible uh, legacy of, of amazing artwork, you know, um, and and we so things like Punch, which which was heavily illustrated, and and, and lots of the, the newspapers before uh, everything turned to colour and photographs. There was this wonderful uh, tradition of of cartoons, so they were allowed. But it's weird. It's almost like you can only you can only have cartoons if you're an adult in this country if you read them in newspapers. Yeah, you know? and they they were one panel or maybe yeah, three. Three They're lucky. Panel. The pocket cartoons or uh, or mm. editorial cartoons or political cartoons you know or, or caricatures and that's that's where it was and, and then comic strips were once again for the children which i, mm. I find baffling baffling mm. <laughs> there, there was a, a, a time when the Daily Mirror had a whole page of comic yeah. strips, including mm -hmm. these serialised ones like Garth, and there was a Western strip. Those were uh, the dramatic ones. Uh, there was Jane, whose clothes yeah. fell off. That was also serialised. <laughs> great, then, great for the female audiences. <laughs> well, no, well, now, now about Jane, interesting because I actually, I actually, I, uh, I edited a collection of Jane uh, several years ago. She's a fascinating character. Uh, she, she did so much for the war effort. It was amazing. She was considered by Churchill to be one of one of one of the most important propaganda tools that the British Army had uh, and and her, co her, new, her comic strips and the newspapers had to be shipped round to keep all the troops going and it said that, that, that <laughs> it said that the day she finally went nude there's one suit where she actually loses all of her clothing that the British Fifth Army advanced seven miles <laughs> <laughs> so she, well that's incredible that's that's i'm very impressed that, actually <laughs> uh, se sexist exploitation in comics uh, is nothing new obviously uh, no. but sometimes we see japanese manga and uh, are quite taken aback by their representation of uh, nudity and uh, teenage sexuality there's a different approach isn't there laura I think so. I mean, it's it's quite obvious that, you know, m most teenagers e experiment with sex, so you might as well talk about it and educate, I guess, if you can. There's obviously the salacious side uh, for drama. Um, there's a, I think it's Shonen magazine, boys magazine, um, and it has... Um, uh, always has a photo of a young lady in a bikini on it, uh, even though it contains nothing but comics. <laughs> it's, it's just what it is. Um, but I think there is something, you know, n normalized, which can only be a good thing. Um, obviously, there are things in certain mangas that we've heard about or perhaps read that haven't particularly been consenting, which is which is a worry. But we absolutely shouldn't paint everything by, you know, perhaps the ban this sick filth. Uh, Daily Mail headlines that used to run when Manga Video uh, released all of its Japanese animation back in the day. Oh, really? Is that mm -hmm. is that where I'm getting this distorted? Possib possibly. Well? I mean, you know, there's 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 just so much. There's just so much variation, and you know, I don't think anything should be you know banned from comics, and you know, we should have uh, responsibility within comics from publishers and things like that. However, experimentation. That's what a lot of manga's done. Quite so. Rose of Versailles, is it available over here? You can. I, I got mine from Amazon and the the book, what's it? Not the bookseller. Uh, it might be the bookseller. <laughs> and basically, good online stores will import it, ship it. Um, so, yeah, the company that publishes it is Udon Entertainment. Udon is a thick Japanese noodle. I don't know if you've had any, but they're very yeah. tasty. Um, so, yeah, Udon Entertainment. They actually started off about 10, 15 years ago just doing video game Street Fighter 2 adaptations. But now they are a fully fledged translator, distributor, publisher of other titles. Um, but, yeah, I'm not aware of any other works that Ryoko Ikeda has had translated but she's very well known in France and Italy where the Rose of Versailles animation was televised and repeated for decades. Um, most Italian animation 
French animation fans will absolutely know about Rose of Versailles or Lady Oscar. They called it after the fictional guard as opposed to Versailles overall. But uh, yeah, it's fascinating. You'll see their eyes light up and oh, Oscar was so handsome and things like this. It's very sweet. But yeah, well, huge impact everywhere apart from Britain, it let, seems. <laughs> let's hope that the uh, comic readers in Britain will catch up now. Thank you, Laura. You're very welcome. It, Thank you. I think it's time to have a look at what David has brought to share. Bear with. Hello? Now, can you see that on your screen? I can. It's about a, an inch wide. <laughs> has it has it got has it got any bigger yet? It has. So we've got a, a, a chubby hand and a hammer. Someone's hammering in some jigsaw pieces into a puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> it's black and white line art with some zip tone screen tone shading but it's so zoomed in david <laughs> has presented us with a teaser today which is good uh, oh my gosh. i'm all for shaking up the format and that's what david has done we can see a hand it's a slightly uh, i would say a pudgy short fingered hand it's emerging from a black sleeve with a frilly cuff and that pudgy hand is squeezing jigsaw pieces in with the assistance of a hammer and it is a black and white line drawing as Laura has said um, okay we're gonna have to pull back now I know for <laughs> for probably both of us this is going to be uh, too much of a reveal but let us see uh, viewer at home if you want to see these images you'll find them on my website kevfcomicartist.com it should also be on the holding image for the podcast itself depending where you get your podcasts from but you won't need to see the image because Laura is now going to describe <laughs> the full image what are we looking at Laura fantastic we are in some a family's living room there's a television um on the left it, it's featuring I'm gonna guess it's a politician but my my bad political history knowledge is gonna show it right here his eyebrows are massive they're like two furry Mars bars stuck on his forehead um we've got a dog shouting at the television with lines coming out of his mouth uh we've got a, a man kind of semi asleep semi relaxed looking at oh healy oh it's ted healy's budget tomorrow dennis, dennis, uh, healy. dennis healy sorry um and the budget <laughs> so the newspaper's talking about the budget healy's budget tomorrow budget budget we've got two little twins on the floor they've got little bobble hats they kind of look like the flumps but less hairy um <laughs> and they've each got a little piggy bank on one says his one says mine we've got <laughs> a very anxious lady i think looking looking at the jigsaw pieces that another person is hammering in to make them fit we've also got another it looks like a small old man but it's not it's a baby i think <laughs> reaching up to this tired tired uh character holding these jigsaw pieces next to her are some pills i've just spotted another dog sneakily <laughs> watching the television behind the chap looking at the budget newspaper in the background we've got a couple of pictures on the wall we've got <laughs> we've got big ben that house is upside down. What's going on? <laughs> the fact <laughs> that Laura has got so many things to describe in this picture oh should tell anybody <laughs> at home who's familiar with this artist the picture we're looking at. To have what amounts to about a dozen different jokes in one single cartoon is uh, the hallmark of this artist. The picture of the Houses of Parliament hung upside down on the wall. It's exactly the throwaway thing. There's also a ball flying through the air. Can you see it? Just in oh, front yes, of the door that, that mm -hmm. has been thrown by the small child oh. who is behind grandma who is yeah. the character all in black um if you're not familiar with this artist uh then you're not as old as david and i and <laughs> it is time for you to now catch up uh, laura would you like to guess who we're looking at uh yeah, it's uh artist giles he's just known as giles isn't he with yes, all of his comics yeah. yes, carl, carl giles carl but his, giles if anybody were in doubt his signature is there uh david tell us more about this picture well this this picture is from the th uh, 32nd volume of giles uh and um it's from 1975 april the 17th i think um I, I've been a huge Giles fan um, my whole life, ever since I was given my first annual by my mum from my sister. You know, that, that old thing where uh, here's a present from your sister, but it's been signed by your mum. 
and uh, <laughs> I, I fell in love with Giles. Uh, uh, I was Giles is was an extraordinary draftsman, just incredible. Uh, and if you look at this picture, the skill with which he's done this drawing, it, it's breathless. It's uh, the, the the perspective, the the way he draws drapes, uh, everything about this picture is stunning. But what I love most about about this is um, um, <laughs> is basically grandma. So grandma's in in the in the bottom right, and she's this little old lady, as as, as Kevin described her, uh, black with white frilly uh, uh, collars and um, uh, and sleeves. Collars, no cuffs, cuffs and and, and a collar. And she's she's wears glasses. She's got a short haircut, and she's doing a puzzle. And now, what I loved about this as a kid is that a lot of the time I look at these these cartoons, I wouldn't understand the gag. So when I read this as a kid, I had no idea what 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 the budget meant and who Dennis Healy was or anything like that. It's, as an adult, I can look at it and laugh, and I think it's amusing. But what I loved about this is I I, I vividly remember this. This is one of those rare cartoons that that I remember. And, and and what I remember about this is is that when I saw Grandma on the bottom and she was hammering that that puzzle. I burst out laughing because I thought it was so funny. And I suddenly started looking at Giles cartoons with a completely different eye. I, I sort of started looking for all the hidden gags. And the great thing about Giles, he would just litter his cartoons with these wonderful sight gags. Just amazing. They're, so he, he did this whole fake family. He didn't, he never had children. Um, but the whole Giles family that there were the, the as Laura's pointed out, there's the twins. Uh, you got Aunt Vera sitting in the background who always went around with uh, with grandma and she was constantly ill. And on, on the chair by her in this picture, there's a little bottle of pills. Um, so there was um, you got the little kid uh, behind grandma who's lobbing the ball. Now, if you if you what I love about this picture also is that the ball is clearly for Butch, the dog who's barking at Dennis Healy. So the idea is, is that the ball's going to sail over the top. The dog's going to attack the TV, knock the TV over. So there's all this sort of stuff. There's he's telling us a gag. He's giving us other stuff going on. There's so much in this drawing, which I just find I just find it uh, exhilarating. I, I try looking at it now and I got goosebumps. I, I just adore Giles. He was such an amazing cartoonist. Just, we put. We played a game at a comic festival in, I think it was Manchester back in 1998 on stage. And we had a whole load of hosts, including uh, Bob Wayne, who's the uh, oh, yeah. CEO from DC Comics. And it was a game called The Best. We pitted one comic against another comic and each of the creators brought along something that they championed. And the winner was Giles. Oh. After, which, after which Bob Wayne had to ask me, what's a Giles? Because <laughs> uh, we hadn't had images uh, able to show on the screen. And so we'd been discussing these things and he had no idea what we were talking about. But we mm. were talking about this as a comic because we were at the comic convention. And yet... It's not sequential images. It's no. still images. I mean, they're sort of sequential in that if you get through the book, you get a whole year told in pictures. There was a yeah. cartoon published every two or three days. So it's three a week, I think he did, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, and you do a Sunday as well. Yes. And uh, they sum up everything. But the way within this one picture that he makes your eye move from one point oh, to yeah. another works in the same way as comics. Laura read the items out from left to right. We've yeah. then gone back and seen the action going from left to right and from right to left. It's really vivid and it's really moving. What gets me most about Giles is not just his line work. It's not just his composition. It's not just his draftsmanship. It's his world. Yes, yes. Brings you into a realistic and convincing world. I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I have taken his locations and backgrounds and slightly purloined them for my own work. <laughs> Absolutely. Always, always steal from the best. Absolutely. I'm so fascinated by how we start with, with those eyebrows. They're just mesmerizing. Yeah, they are. And then, they? and then we circle. We literally circle all the way to Nan. Mm. And, then, and then you're quite right. You, we see the child throwing the ball and the lines, which bring you back to the start. I'm just fascinated by the line work on those curtains and no, that yeah. swoosh underneath the, so, uh, the sofa chair, the right swoosh. You see where I'm, uh, yeah. it's going to yeah. be hard for people listening to this, understanding mm -hmm. what I'm talking about. But there's this beautiful dry brush, heavy line that works so well yeah. uh, around the intricacies. Because usually the characters that are further to us are drawn with a slightly thicker outline because they're closer to us whereas here the the characters are, are drawn with um presumably dip pen but it's yes. actually the background that has the thicker lines and it does not detract in the slightest i don't think i've seen that done that i've noticed anyway in yeah. comics he uses a, var a variety of line techniques including dry brush including charcoal lines mm. uh, occasional ones i think sunday uh, it, ones are done in watercolor and wash uh, occasionally does the color covers as well and uh, but he never strays far from his palette and uh, doesn't detract you by any sort of flamboyant showing off 
No, not at all. Tell you what he's amazing at. He's the single best artist I've ever seen for, for conveying snow. If you go mm. look at his cartoons and you, you look at any of his snowy scenes, he can he can tell so much by leaving stuff out. It is staggering. He 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 does snow in a way that you can feel the weight of it. You can feel the, the, the you can feel the chill in the air, the weight of it. It's just beautiful. You know, uh, honestly, he he is such a an amazing cartoonist, one of the absolute, you know, greats. It tells you so much about how much emphasis we put on the drawings that none of us has actually mentioned the caption. The caption, <laughs> uh, which is, uh, it's the father who's reading the paper. He is the one who has his mouth open to speak. And it's saying in the caption underneath, shut up, butch, we'll wait till we see what he does tomorrow. Uh, that's referring to what Dennis Healy will do in his budget tomorrow. So actually, that gag is way less interesting than everything else that happens in the picture. Absolutely. Often the case with, with Jars, I feel. Interesting thing about Jars was that he was left wing, but he his work appeared in the Express. And yes, he, the, the Express couldn't be a more rabid right wing paper in subsequent years. I don't know how bad it was in the 1970s. Probably pretty bad. Because the thing was that he had worked for Reynolds News, which was very left wing. And he, he did sort of feel slightly guilty when he went to the Express and the Sunday Express. But they were offering him such a huge salary. He'd be, he'd be crazy not to. But I mean, I, I, he actually said that later on that he never agreed with the Daily Express's policies or politics. And he felt guilty about abandoning the more left wing Reynolds News. But it did make him wealthy. And oh, also, he, he reached he reached a large audience, which would uh, stop him singing to the choir, wouldn't it? He would be <laughs> reaching an audience and maybe he might feel he could win hearts and minds by presenting. It was a very liberal outlook. You never get any right wing politics squeezing in. You get a small C conservatism in the way that the world is. But it's looked at through a very generous liberal eye. I wonder whether he managed to get any kind of surreptitious lefty views then in his comics to speak um, to that right wing audience i think i think certainly in the way that, that he presented the jars family they 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 were i mean like they were they were well to do well, no, i wouldn't say well to do but that they they had a boat they had a, which makes them sound well to do but that they all lived under one roof they were they were i mean they definitely they definitely touched on subjects which were which were topical that there's a i can remember one where there was this share share a bath you know and i remember him doing gags about that and he, he often he used to take the mickey out of 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 uh, the aristocracy and the rich they'd, they'd of, of, always be uh victims of, of his humor but but he he himself he was one of the first war correspondents to actually get to the concentration camps and, I hadn't uh, realised that. Yeah, he actually he actually got to uh, to, to uh, Bergen Belsen, and uh, there's actually an astonishing uh, sketchbook which is so moving of of his drawings of the actual uh, concentration camp, and he actually got to uh, <laughs> interview the camp commandant, who it turned out was actually a fan of his. How very bizarre! Yes, uh, Carl Giles, whose work starts um, in the. Second World War, yes, in the 1940s, yes, the first book came out in forty-three. Yeah, continues right up to something like two thousand and one, wasn't it? Well, he died in nineteen ninety-five, but the books are continued. Oh, now. continued up to nineteen ninety-five. I meant to say. Yeah, no. What I was, was going to say was, there was even though the books uh, they they carried on publishing the Jars Annual every year, but what's so interesting was that he's he selected every cartoon in the books up until his death. So there is so much material that's never been reprinted, and so every time they bring out a new Jars Annual, there's new Jars stuff that's never been printed before. Mind I blown! I did not realise that. Now that I, wow. what's so annoying is I stopped collecting in 1995, and I only found this out recently, which means I've got 20 years worth of more collecting to do. <laughs> that good uh, or bad <laughs> surely that's know. good <laughs> i i find i have all but three giles books uh, after a while i've never sort of i occasionally maintain a list and then go out and look for them but i, I was left with only a, a couple from the 40s and the very early 50s and little by little bit by bit antique shop by antique shop i've yes. got them yes i've got them all up to 1995 so they are, they are, they are, I intend to be buried with them. There's a few books I intend to be buried with. There's those. And I also want to get buried with my EC box set collection. Oh, you know, my dad had those. When really? We were, when I was growing up. So I was privy to the old EC comics. And unfortunately, he sold them. And he said it's the worst regret of buying and selling that he's ever done, which is selling his EC box sets. But he's got them all on digital now. So that's fine. But at the, at, at the time, he was like, for years, he was like, oh, I shouldn't have sold them. <laughs> right, it's, talking about, it's talking about comics that you can go back to. I regularly pull out a Giles annual and we will revisit and reread it. I, I, do this, I do the same with the EC comics as well, although they are, I must admit, in storage. And the Giles annuals are all still in the house right behind me. I can see them from here. I can see mine from here, too. 
I love them. I love them to bits. Fantastic. Them. Are your rooms uh, like full of books? Because as yeah. is like a library. Someone said that my living room is like a shop because it's basically just got all my books. But I, I just love, I feel so uh, comfortable being in amongst my, my books, my stories. Well, if you saw my whole green screen, you'd see, uh, in fact, my entire library. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> That's not your library. That's my actual library, I swear on it. <laughs> of course, I mean, like, you can't be a cartoonist without books. I mean, there you go. You, you have to have them. You have to have them near you. You have to, because there's, there'll always come a time if you're drawing something, you go, oh, I want to draw that. And then you go and find the book which inspired you. And then you, you, you like, like Kevin said earlier on, you go looking for that drawing that, that, that's, that you, then you use it as a reference, you know? Mm -hmm. So, God, yeah, it's so, I love these damn things. Thank you, David. Thank you, Laura. We have been looking at Giles by Giles and Rose of Versailles by Ryoko Ikeda. And those were brought in by David Leach and Laura Watton. Uh, if you want to find out more, if you want to ask us anything or tell us anything, you can find us on our various social media. Uh, Laura, where do we find you? Uh, you can find me on pinkapplejam.com pretty much all social media i've uh, nabbed the pink apple jam name so uh, have a google and see where you can find me and drop us a message if you fancy and david where do we find you i think your best place to find me would be um, my psychogram facebook page so if you go on facebook and put in psychogram you'll find her uh, which is the, the one of the reasons i love the giles granny is that giles granny inspired me to create psycho gran so that this is the inspiration for psycho gran that and the um hell's grannies from monty python if they, any if any listener has not found Psycho Gran yet, do find Psycho Gran. <laughs> I myself am on Twitter at KevF Comic Artist and on the website kevfcomicartist.com. Please click subscribe to be sure of hearing every episode when it comes out. Thanks again to Laura Watton and David Leach and to you at home for listening. I've been Kev F and this has been Comic Cuts, the panel show. And we're out. Hey! Well done, Thanks. everybody. Thank you. you so much. Yeah. That was really good. How gorgeously professional were you two? I think that should have the least amount of me in when I edit it. <laughs> <laughs> I just we just like talking about comics, don't we, David? <laughs> like, look, look at all these things. Look at them. Yeah. That was That's nice. great. That's great. That's... Yeah. Splendid. Yeah. Well, I need to detain you no longer. It's been an absolute treat. Is anybody getting to any of the comic festivals that are coming up at LFCC? I'd like to, but I'm chronically ill. So I've basically oh. stayed in the house for like two years, <laughs> it oh, seems. Crimes. So I'm a little bit crime and all. But I've had both my vaccinations. I think I'm just waiting for more people to be vaccinated to feel a bit more confident about going out. I was tempted to visit MCM Comic Con, but I'm, I'm still not sure. But also, like, I've got a lot of friends who feel the same way, regardless of their, yeah. you know, illness yeah. or not. I really, I'd really love to. I really want to take my dad down to the London Comic Mart as well, because we all live in East Anglia now. And he mm -hmm. hasn't been to, a, we used to go to comic marts all the time in the West Midlands, but in East Anglia, there's actually not that many. It's like mm. a few events or comic shops, but I'd like to take him into London so we can have a moot around. But uh, no, no plans just yet, but vague plans. And there's the lakes in October and Thought Bubble in November. David, Are making either of those? Well, they just announced Frank Miller, haven't they, in Thought Bubble? Yes, they have. Have they? Mm. Oh. It was only today, wasn't it? Hey? I think I only saw that today on a post. Yeah, I saw it today, mm. too, yeah. Right, rabid right wing conspiracy nut. Uh, yeah, I Trump, know, I know, Trumpian. But, but then look at all his, the amazing things he's done. Just ignore the right wing Trumpian bollocks and think about Daredevil and think about all the incredible Ronin. I've been reading Ronin. He's astonishing. The podcast I recorded f just before you had uh, Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns, and mm -hmm. we didn't say anything disparaging about him at all. Well, because th that could take up a whole program in its own right. So could talking about the sequel as well. Oh uh, yeah. Oh, and the other sequel, the other one that came out, that's wretched. Oh wow. Well, so how, how do you go from that to that? I, well, I think I think it's it's money, isn't it? I think it's um, money and, and a serious coke problem. I think it is. Oh. Mm. I'll do it. I'll do it every time. <laughs> it wouldn't know. Were you at that comic convention that Frank Miller was at? I remember we were standing around the bar and there was Alan Moore, Frank Miller, David Leach, Lou Stringer. I think I think I think I'm imagining David Leach being there. <laughs>
Amazing. What a lineup. <laughs> and it was great. And we were, uh, Steve Noble, my mate who was there as well, was then talking to some American friends and they couldn't believe this because in, in American conventions, the creators uh, by that stage, which was the late 80s, 88, 89, uh, didn't get that close to the public. But in Britain, they still did. Uh, yeah. Alan Moore stopped coming not long after that because... Well, that's because he got stopped in the toilets while he's having a piss, wasn't it? Yes, it was. <laughs> you know, it's that great cartoon that I think Lou drew. Yes. Was about that. Yeah. I mean, that was the great thing about UCAT. UCATs were a great convention because, like you say, you, you know, I mean, the only reason to go to UCAT was to be in the bar and talk to other artists. I think that's probably changed a lot over the years. Let's face it, it's not all blokes who drink. Uh, the older ones don't drink anymore because of their health, and the younger ones didn't drink in the first place, and half of them are women. Bloody blokes who are women. <laughs> I, mean, I, I enjoy a good drink, but it's like, do you, I will talk your face off about manga. Or whatever. So I, yeah. <laughs> this is what I look forward to. I'm I those conventions were all well and good in their time, but I wouldn't like to go back to that situation. I always used to parody uh, at the time as like it was like World of Leather. You would be <laughs> at the bar and there would just be leather trench coats which went down to people's ankles and a ponytail. <laughs> Just a load of blokes with beards and ponytails and uh, looking like that wrestler, the Undertaker, was it? <laughs> That's well, all. That's all you could see. Uh, to be fair, there's still a, a massive section of comic cons and anime conventions because there is that crossover with sci-fi conventions. Before, yes, true. Because even in Japan, the whole anime convention thing wasn't its own thing. It, it was a spin-off of sci-fi conventions, but yeah. yeah, it's still a massive contingency. Now we've added Fedora, but uh, yeah, Fedora, know, fedoras, and leather coats. Oh. It's all very like <laughs> post-Matrix Edge Lord. Yes, I know more than you. It's no, isn't, it, isn't it fascinating the, the things that people pick up on uh, those those costumes and, and everything exactly. anyway I, I must yeah. keep you no longer we're, right. we're coming up to eight o'clock I promised I wouldn't take more than an hour of your time and I'm so honoured and flattered that you've joined me thank you David thank well, you Laura. I was going to say Kev that, that I didn't I didn't I don't think oh I don't think actually at no point did I actually point out what I've done or how I got to where I am I started and then, and then I made that faux pas and then it got cut off so I didn't actually I don't actually explain who I am or what I've done. Do you want to show it Scro to scroll, scrolling back sound effect, David yeah. CV. No, I don't mean CV. I don't mean that. I just mean, you know, it was it was the question of... Um, um, oh, wait, wait. Would you like, like me to set you up with a nice question about your, uh, about your work? Uh, yes. David, for, any, for anybody who's not familiar with your work, go on, uh, in 90 <laughs> seconds. 90 seconds, okay. Yeah, hi, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm currently I work as the, as Titan Comics as senior creative editor, where I edit things like Blade Runner, uh, Phantom of the Opera, uh, Rivers of London, Extraordinary. Uh, prior to that, while at the same time doing my own crime books, and prior to that, I was a cartoonist, started out in Oink. Uh, actually, started out before that working as Bob Godfrey's ghost artist on Henry's Cat. Uh, that's where I got my, my big break when I left college. And then I went to work in Oink, and that's where I think you and I met, Kev, around about Oink days. I think it probably then, was. From there, went onwards to things like gas and brain damage and arts. And then I'd worked for Marvel US doing the Toxic Crusaders. And then I betrayed my my art, my craft, and became an evil editor. And I've spent the last 20, I think, 20 years working as an editor for people like Marvel UK and, and Panini and now Titan. So uh, that's me in a nutshell. Oh, and then in my spare time, when I'm not making other people's comics, I'm doing Psycho Gran, the world's most violent old lady, which I've been enjoying since 1986. She was my first professional cartoon character, and she appeared in Wink. And I'm still doing her 30 years later, the old bag. And that's it. With a bit of silence at the end, I can drop that in right at the start. Thank you. Of your, of your piece. Thank how you very much. I appreciate it. How interesting that. also that we both chose panel that were just a few years apart. Oh, really? Early yeah, 70s. So, yeah. so mine, mine was 72, did I say? Oh, okay. Yes, you did say 72. 72 and David was 1975. 75, yeah. Hang on, hang on a minute. I'll tell you exactly when it was. Oh, I can't find it now. Oh, well. uh, yeah, it, it, the most of the choices that people have made, I've done seven of these so far, I think, mm -hmm. um, have been from the past because obviously they're talking about co comics that have influenced them. So mm -hmm. we had the Dark Knight Returns. We had a Twinkle comic. Um, oh. Earlier today, we had the Four Marys from the Bunty. Um, oh. More yeah. uh, Sonia Long picked yep. a, a much more recent manga from 2008. Um, I don't know if you heard that one that she did. Uh, uh, Nigel Park. Oh, yeah. It was a Saints Young Men. Oh, yes. Yes. With Buddha and Jesus in it. Now, that that was yeah. a late early 2000s one. And I know that the creator didn't actually want it released because of what a kerfuffle it may 
Ah, right, was yeah. in the no, West. However, it has been released now. Yeah, yeah, so uh, modern and more recent comics have mm. been thin on the ground and people have gone. Uh, Nigel Parkinson chose uh, Fraser of Africa from Eagle. So he went right back oh, to lovely. the 1950s. I think that's the oldest uh, yeah. selection anyone's mm. made so far. Yes, mine was actually quite late. Actually, mine, this is the Giles Annual. This is mm. the actual one. This is number 32 and this is from 1978. So it would, it would have come out in 77 and I would have been 14. So. Wow. Yeah, I would have got that for Christmas. I, I, I got my first one for Christmas in 1974 and then got my next few at Jumble sales uh, in that year or, or so afterwards because I started becoming a, a Giles collector. I think that happens to everybody. No, I th absolutely. They're very hard to find original artwork for sale. It's very hard. He, he, he didn't sell it off. He kept it all. Oh, really? I was thinking it was snapped up at the time. No, I no, wonder, no. He, I wonder he, where he, it is now. Well, he oh, donated God, I hope it survived. Well, he donated nearly all of it to the uh, RL... RLNI, the Royal Lifeboat Doodah Wild. Yeah, yeah. Because he was a huge fan of this. In fact, you must look at, check out his, the, the artwork he did for them. He'd always do Christmas cards from every year. Yeah. I, well, there's a couple of the more recent annuals have collected up a lot of those colour things. Mm. And uh, yeah, the RNLI um, Christmas cards. I've, oh, I've got fascinating. Them, those ones, yeah. I wonder. Um, I wonder whether it's part of Bob Monkhouse's collection because it's the, the type of comic. It is Bob Monkhouse would collect, right? Around that era, he collected yeah. everything. He collected. He did. He did. It's it's really, weird it's really weird you're mentioning Bob because he's suddenly he's popped up on my on my Facebook feed for a lot oh. of days. It's just suddenly everyone's posting that that, that the, the the video he made when he found out he was dying of pancreatic cancer. He made a jokey sort of. Um, wasn't pancreatic it was uh, prostate cancer. Mm. He made a jokey video about it to try and encourage men to get their prostate. Oh. And right. he's just been popping up on, my, on both my Twitter and my Facebook for the last I wonder week. if it's an anniversary. Oh, Might it must be. be. Yes. Might be. be. Oh. Either that or it's uh, the campaign's week or month. Mm -hmm. It could be because we've just started a month, so it could be uh, oh. Prostate Cancer Month. That would oh, be yeah. the reason. <laughs> my favourite month of the year. <laughs> <laughs> that, that guys, November. Oh. <laughs> guys, if you don't have to go, I do. So <laughs> That's away, with, away with you, big on. Thank you, <laughs> both. Thank you so Thanks much. So much. Happy to be fun. on a future one as well. Take care. Right, I'll All let you know best. when it, I'll let you know when it's coming up. Thanks Perfect. Okay. Thank you so Cheers. much. Bye. Bye.